there is a single theme, a unifying theme that ties together our readings this morning, and it is the subject of repentance and the call to conversion. It's interesting to consider the fact that that word repentance is one of the most important, one of the most frequently used words in all the sacred scripture. In our gospel today, our Lord's first words as he begins his public ministry are, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And at one point, our Lord told the apostles that in any place where the people refused to hear that word and act on it, they were to leave that place and shake the dust from their feet as a testimony against them. Every messenger ever sent by God in the Old Testament and the New, from the prophets to the apostles, all of them were given the power of the Holy Spirit and sent to preach a message of repentance first. And the reason for that is that no one can be saved unless that person is willing to repent. And to repent takes humility. Now, what does it mean to repent? What exactly do we mean when we talk about repentance? Well, to repent basically means to turn away from the things in your life that are not pleasing to God and turn toward the things that are. First, to repent means turn away from sin. Put sin out of your life. Change your life according to God's will. It means to conform your life to God's wisdom and will, even when God's will doesn't conform to your own opinions. Now, we all know that the prevailing mentality today, morally speaking, is relativism. The idea that there is no distinction between opinions and truth. Whatever your opinions are, that is the truth for you. Hmm? Now, we've all got opinions. Right? You have opinions, and I have opinions, and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and all the rest have all got opinions. But don't call yourself a Catholic, let alone a devout Catholic, if you reject God's word, God's eternal moral law in favor of your own opinions. That's hypocrisy. Now, second, to repent means to seek the mercy of God with the spirit of true contrition. We say there are three elements to true contrition, sorrow for sin, hatred for sin, and a firm purpose of amendment, which means that you're going to try with the help of God's grace to avoid the same sins in the future. And finally, to repent means to actually do penance to make some kind of reparation for his sin. We can think of what we call the acts of the penitent, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and the like. We're called to make reparation because we know that in some mysterious way, our sins wound and disrupt the order of God's creation. We say that repentance is the gateway, the open door to the mercy of God. Now, I have to make this point. God's message of mercy to the world did not begin with our Lord's revelations to St. Faustina in the 1930s, and it did not begin with the Sacred Heart devotions in the 17th century. There's nothing new about God's proclamation of His mercy. It's all over the sacred scriptures. And I'm always complaining about these whacked-out modernist scripture scholars in their commentaries in the Bible, and they try to tell us that the Bible essentially presents us with two different gods. They say there is the God of the Old Testament, and there is the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament, they say, is the God of anger, wrath, judgment, punishment, and vengeance. And the God of the New Testament, fully revealed in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, is the God of love and mercy and compassion. Well, that's a lot of nonsense because God doesn't change. You see, God doesn't change, people change. God doesn't change, we change. The Apostle St. James wrote, in God there is no alteration nor any shadow of change. 
God said to the prophet Malachi, surely I, the Lord your God, do not change. You see, the Bible presents us with different pictures of God at different points in salvation history, but never a contradictory one. The Bible clearly shows us a God who is merciful, both merciful and just. It's all through Scripture. We can think of a few examples from the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, for example, God was ready to spare the people of Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten just men. They couldn't find ten just men. In our first reading today, God spares the people of Nineveh when they repented the preaching of Jonah as awful as their crimes were. And if you think about it, you realize how awesome a thing that was because Nineveh was the great city of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were the Nazis of the Old Testament. They were the great persecutors of the Jewish people. They were cruel, brutal, cold-blooded killers. God forgave them. They repented. The book of the prophet Isaiah begins with a message from God to the people of Israel. God says, wash yourselves clean, cease doing evil, learn to do good. Come now, let us set things right, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they may become white as snow. And if they be crimson red, they will be made white as wool, if you are willing and repent. The message of divine mercy resonates in sacred tradition. The lives of the saints and their writings one of my uh, favorite quotations is from St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower. She said this, quote, If the greatest sinner on earth should repent at the moment of death and draw his last breath in an act of love, neither the many graces he had abused nor the many sins he had committed would stand in his way. Our Lord would receive him into his mercy. No one can make me frightened anymore because I know what to believe about his mercy. I know that in the twinkling of an eye, all those thousands of sins would be consumed as a drop of water cast into a blazing fire. We can think of the writings of St. Faustina. Our Lord said this to St. Faustina. When a soul sees and realizes the gravity of its sins, when the whole abyss of the misery into which it immersed itself is displayed before its eyes, let it not despair, but with trust, let it throw itself into the arms of my mercy. These souls have a right of priority to my compassionate heart. They have first access to my mercy. Tell them that no soul that is called upon my mercy has been disappointed or brought to shame. I often think that if our Lord was preaching among us today as he did in the days of his public life, he would be immediately canceled by the mainstream media. The whole left-wing establishment and the PC police, he would be immediately censored on social media. He would be dropped by Facebook and Twitter and all the like for, quote, harmful content or hate speech. As I like to say, Truth is the new hate speech. But you know, it is impossible to talk about the mercy of God if you don't talk about repentance. And it's impossible to talk about repentance if you don't talk about sin. Of course, it is obvious that many priests and bishops will not talk about the reality of sin and the need for repentance, especially when it comes to the hard truths of the faith the hot button issues, the things that pertain to the Sixth and Ninth Commandments, uh, the issues like the sanctity of marriage and human sexuality and the sanctity of human life, the commandments, the virtues and the like, kind of like the doctor who doesn't want to deal with a disease. We priests are called to be the physicians of the soul. But let me ask you this. What would you think about a doctor, a physician, 
who cared nothing about disease, didn't want to talk about it, didn't want to treat it, didn't want to be bothered with it, didn't care a thing about the physical health of his patients, and all this doctor really cared about was billing his patients and getting their money. What would you think of a doctor like that? We got names for doctors like that, don't we? We call them quacks, incompetence. So what would you call a priest or a bishop who is afraid or doesn't care enough to speak out against sin? What would you call the physician of the soul will not deal with the one thing that can kill the life of grace in the soul, mortal sin. Jesus said to St. Faustina, daughter, know this once and for all, there's only one thing that can separate a soul from me, and that is mortal sin, that alone, our Lord said. You see, the sick man, the patient who dies because the doctor was negligent, would only lose his physical life. When a priest fails to speak out against sin, some of his people may well lose their souls. An eternal death is far, far worse than a physical death. God offers the gift of his mercy. You've got to cooperate with that grace. Now, whenever we talk about the divine mercy, I think we've also got to talk about the two really bad responses to it. The worst responses to divine mercy. Two opposite extremes, sins against the virtue of hope. The first, the most rampant today, is presumption. Presumption. The idea that God is so loving and so merciful that it doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter what I believe. Doesn't matter how I live. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to have my fun. I don't have to repent. I don't have to change my ways. I'm going to heaven anyway. That's the big lie. The devil's trap. Poison for the soul. Then the other extreme, the sin against the virtue of hope, is despair. You see, the devil is always trying to drag us down into despair. Despair in a Christian sense is the idea that my sins are too big and too bad and too many for God to forgive. It is that rotten, insidious little voice that tries to get into your head telling you, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care anything about you. God is not going to forgive you. You've gone on too long in your sins. You've gone too far. There's no turning back now for you. So why don't you just give it up? It's no use. It's too late for you. God has abandoned you. There's no hope for you. Despair. I've heard despair called the capital city of hell. Now, if you think that your sins are bigger than the mercy of God, then you really are in trouble. You're in big trouble. Hmm? Listen to the words of Archbishop Fulton Sheen from his book entitled Peace of Soul. Quote, the figure upon the cross is not a KGB agent or a Gestapo inquisitor, but a divine physician who only asks that we bring our wounds to him in order that he may heal them. Was it not he who told us, I say to you, there shall be more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than over 99 just? In the story of the prodigal son, did he not describe the father as saying, let us eat and make merry because this son of mine was dead. Now he's alive again. He's lost and is found. Why is there more joy in heaven for the repentant sinner than for the righteous? Because God's attitude is not judgment, but love. End quote. God's attitude is not judgment, but love. 
having said all that, um, just to review, um, remember that nothing has changed. The teaching of the church has never changed. You see, if you die unrepentant, if you die in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. Hell is real. Hell is forever. How do we know that? Jesus told us so more than 90 times in the four Gospels. So you got to take God at his word. I always say, don't mess with God. Don't play fast and loose with the salvation of your soul. You may lose it, but that's not God's will for anyone. God is always that loving, merciful Father of the gospel who waits with open arms for us to come home. And what is the most beautiful expression and experience of the mercy of God? What is the most powerful channel of the divine mercy? Of course, it is the sacrament of penance, confession. Confession, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, positively, the best source of peace there is in the whole world. Say what you will. Confession. The sacrament given to us by Christ himself in the Gospel of St. John as the ordinary means for the forgiveness of mortal sins committed after baptism. You recall uh, the classic definition of a sacrament, the catechism. The sacrament, we say, is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Keep in mind that when you come to confession, in addition to receiving the forgiveness of your sins through absolution, you're always also receiving an increase in God's grace, a sacramental grace that will strengthen you from within by the action of the Holy Spirit in your soul. That grace is going to help you to fight off temptation and avoid the same sins in the future. And we all need that sacramental grace in the spiritual battle of our lives. You know, on those sad occasions, those rare occasions when I've had to refuse someone absolution in the confessional, most of the time it had been for the same thing. Most of the time it was because that person was absolutely convinced of his or her own goodness, his or her own righteousness, while at the same time holding on to some grave sin with no firm purpose of amendment, no intention of change in their ways. People like this come into the confessional with an attitude. The idea that morality, what's right, what's wrong, is not what God says it is. It's not what the church teaches that it is. It's what I say that it is. And I'm going to play by my own rules. I'm going to live the way I want to live. Don't try to tell me anything. Friends, the virtue of humility demands that all of us recognize that we are sinners in need of God's mercy. God is infinitely loving. And God is infinitely merciful. We have God's love and God's mercy, but the two are not necessarily the same. The two are not always the same. You got to get this. They differ only in this. God's love is unconditional. God's mercy, the reception of God's mercy is not unconditional. The reception of God's mercy is conditioned, dependent upon our willingness to repent and turn away from sin. That's the way it is. 
Pope St. John Paul II, in a homily that he gave early on in his pontificate, said this, quote, the apostle of confession is surely the best source of peace and joy there is in the whole world. Those confessionals scattered about the world where men declare their sins don't speak of the severity of God, they speak of his mercy. And all those who approach the confessional sometimes, after many years weighed down with mortal sins, in the moment of getting rid of the terrible burden, find at last a long for relief. They find joy and tranquility of conscience, which outside confession they'll never be able to find anywhere. So let me ask you something. When is the last time that you made a good, thorough examination of conscience? Hmm? In a really good confession. I mean a really thorough, heartfelt, sincere confession. If you haven't done it in a while, there's no moment like the present, right? Now is the time to make a new start because our Lord is always waiting for you, waiting for you to come in the sacrament of his mercy.